Hey friends, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about how autophagy and increasing autophagy can improve gut health. So what we have here is this intestinal epithelial layer, which is sort of a, a really simplified and dumbed down version of your small intestine. And right here, we're gonna hone in on a specific cell type that is improved. I mean, the function of that cell type is improved when autophagy is upregulated. And when autophagy is downregulated, when you're snacking all the time, if you're not exercising, if you're over consuming energy, if you're you know, not stressing your body in a favorable way via exercise, this critical cell type called the panath cell, which is responsible for uh, secreting intestinal stem cells that help repair and regenerate your intestinal epithelium. So the title of the paper, and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, it's an amazing paper. I wanna thank my friend Frida Tehran. She's an MD, PhD over at University of Iowa who helped get access to this full text paper. It's really hard to track down. But the title of this is How Autophagy Controls the Intestinal Epithelial Barrier. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, why should I care about gut health? Like, who gives a crap? I eat a real food diet anyway. Well, gut health and poor gut health is linked with so many different diseases and conditions from asthma and allergies and, and classical atopy disorders like psoriasis, rosacea, skin issues, things like that. There's even data showing that intestinal permeability or leaky gut is linked with obesity. It's linked with type two diabetes, even mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. And what's more, is these tight junction proteins in the intestinal epithelium are also, they crosstalk with the lung epithelium. So when we think about viral load, when it comes to the virus that's circulating, there is crosstalk and connection between dysbiosis and intestinal permeability here and leaky lung here, and that may be one of the factors. In fact, there were several studies that have actually elucidated some tight junction dysfunction, and guess what? Towards the end of this video, we're gonna sp specifically talk about how autophagy impacts favorably the tight junction protein. So we're gonna get into this, friends. I just wanna welcome you back. It's Mike Meltzer here. As always, I'm grateful for you tuning into this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you do, you can hit that like button. You can subscribe. And also, a lot of people ask me about supplements for autophagy. What I like to tell people is the best way to enhance autophagy is with diet and with exercise. And we have a full autophagy enhancer masterclass with nutrition, nutritional supplements, tools, and things. I will put that link below if you want to take a deep dive into that because the more physically fit you are, the easier it is to upregulate autophagy. And we'll talk about AMPK and mTOR in just a moment. So that's where we're going. I'm really excited that you're here. Let's dive into the nuts and bolts. Now, before we get into the weeds here with these panath cells and the intestinal stem cells and the tight junctions and all that stuff, we need to do a basic review. So I'm gonna move over here and I'm going to talk about the gas pedal and the brakes regulating autophagy. For some of you, this may be a review. We're gonna talk about mTOR. Many of you have heard about this and we're gonna talk about A. Uh, M, P, K. So essentially, this is the brake, and these are intracellular switches. These are kinases, mechanistic target of rapamycin. We have uh, activated uh, monophosphate protein kinase, and so this is gonna be the gas, okay? So mTOR is the brake, A and PK is the gas. But what's unique about A and PK is it also puts the brake on mTOR. So I'm gonna draw that here. Now, let's talk about natural physiologic context in which mTOR would be high or low, or AMPK would be high and low. Now, you might be saying, how can I measure mTOR in my body? Well, there's not, unfortunately, because these are intracellular enzymes. It's not like you can go to a lab and measure them, but you can go to a lab and test your liver function tests. So your AST, ALT, and GGT. You can test your fasting glucose. You can test your fasting insulin and post-meal insulin, and you can test triglycerides. So what we can do is triangulate to see, is your body getting into a state where there's there's plenty of energy deficiency so that you're stimulating these enzymes. Essentially, when you are in a fasted state, if you exercise, you should be able to flip into a, a metabolic signature characteristic of fat oxidation, okay? So therefore, triglycerides should be low, liver enzymes should be low, fasting and post-meal insulin should be low, cholesterol should be low, and so forth. Now, cholesterol is a little debatable, but it is involved in nutrient partitioning, okay? So that's how you would sort of assess this. You can test your first morning uh, glucose and first morning ketones or breath acetone with uh, different you know nutrients and different uh, tools and things of that sort to see in the morning are you oxidizing fat or is your glucose still high if it's still high you may not be getting into that physiologic state that's characteristic of autophagy okay so let's say you eat at a reasonable time you eat say at 6 30 p.m you eat an early dinner you go to bed you get up at 6.30 in the morning, 7 in the morning, something like that, and you go for a walk. So what you're doing is you're depleting muscle glycogen, hepatic glycogen in your liver, and then what's going to happen is your body is going to need to make ATP. So AMPK will increase. 
This is going to put the brakes on mTOR, which we'll dive into in a moment. And this is going to stimulate, and here, henceforth, autophagy is going to be written in the acronym that the scientific literature writes it in as ATG for autophagy, because you can look now at your genes. A lot of individuals from European descent have imbalances in autophagy-related genes, and guess what? They have aberrations in gut health, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, things like this. Are, there's also lung issues and things of that sort. So low energy state, AMPK is increased, it puts the brakes on mTOR, it stimulates autophagy. Now we'll get into the stem cells in one more, just give me one more little second because I want to talk a little bit about more about mTOR. You've heard about this. This is a kinase. There's mTOR C1, mTOR C2. We're focusing on mTOR C1 to simplify this conversation. I think about mTOR C2 sort of like your housing association, your HOA. It's involved in exterior functioning of the cell, cell architecture, uh, cell to cell communication, some things like that. But when we talk about energy and mTOR, it's mTOR C1. Just for you science nerds, just want to clarify that. We talk about that more in the, in the master class. But so mTOR is activated in the post meal window. So now, remember, these are not always good or this is not always bad, okay? You want mTOR to be increased after you eat a meal. You want your body to take the nutrients that you're eating and put those into your muscle tissue uh, to repair some of your sore legs after you do sprints or squatting or whatever, right? You want that growth. You just don't want that growth every single two hours, every two hours, every day, right? You, you want to go through these, life is cyclical. So you wanna feed and then you wanna fast. You wanna feed and fast. So. The challenge for a lot of Americans is we never get that downtime. We're snacking all day, we go to bed late, we snack before bed, we get up, we, ha we break the fast with breakfast, which is high glycemic. So we're constantly sort of beating the mTOR drum and therefore we are never really getting in to this physiologic state of autophagy. Plus we're not exercising. So it's not all food, it also has to do with exercise because guess what exercise does? It stimulates AMPK. And let me just pause, guess what also can stimulate AMPK? intermittent fasting and taking things like berberine. Berberine hydrochloride, I'll put links to a natural product below that's phenomenal. Berberine and also metformin and other things, there's a lot of natural AMPK memetics and activators. So that's one more thing to sort of think about. So if you wanna kickstart your fast with one of those tools, you can. You can kickstart your fast with some exercise, with some sprints to, to uh, affect AMPK. Okay, so now that we sort of laid down the foundation, the groundwork, again, some of you already knew that, that's review, fine. Let's get into the pan, panif cell. So I'll write this down here. So we have this panif cell. Uh, and then right here we have, I'm gonna write ISC for intestinal stem cell. Okay, so this panif cell is in these crypts right here. So you have your lumen. This is how you can increase the surface area of your small intestine. This is how the body of you know, your hu human bodies and animals, how we get more surface area. Because what we have friends going through here is guess what, we have food, we have nutrients, we have water, we have you know uh, bacteria, I'll just draw a little super rudimentary bacteria like that. We have stuff, we have certain things that we need, we have pathogens that we don't want to come in contact with. And these panna cells are key at releasing what are called antimicrobial peptides. And I'll just write for short, AMP. So they are essential for keeping these pathogens from entering into Remember this right here, it's technically called the gastrointestinal lymphoid tissue. Much of your immune system is on the interior side. So if you think about your elementary canal, it's really outside of your body. Like it's kind of weird to think about because you're like, no, this is outside, but you're like, your mouth, it's not, it, it seems like it's inside, but stuff's just passing through, friends. So this is why you have so much mucosal immunity right here. This is why this barrier integrity is so important because when stuff comes across, and I say stuff, I mean things like gluten, for example, dairy, casein, also inflammagens from bacteria, pathogens, viruses, you have your galt here, the gastrointestinal lymphoid tissue, Oop. you have your galt here, With, when this is getting activated, guess what then gets activated? Neurologic inflammation, the microglial cells in your brain, they start to fire. That's why if you have an upset tummy, oftentimes you feel tired and lethargic. So we, we don't want stuff coming across here. And oftentimes that stuff, so to speak, again, I'm really simplifying this just for teaching purposes, is bacterial inflammagens known as lipopolysaccharide is one or endotoxin. They're the same, they're synonymous. LPS and endotoxin are the same. They are found on the exterior surface of gram-negative bacteria. 
you have enough gram negative bacteria in your gut to kill you. Now, what is why you're not being killed is because hopefully you have good integrity of your bowel. But if you if someone were to stab you or if you were to fall accidentally on something and puncture your small intestine, well, you would get sepsis and you get crap or vomit or both coming in and that if you didn't go to the to the physician to the emergency room or ICU you might die, right? But a lot of people have low grade sepsis after every meal. So they feel lethargic, they feel tired and so forth, okay? Now these panna cells are key because what you have here is a little layer, again, I'm really simplifying this, but this little layer of, the, of this mucosal, this antimicrobial peptides and stuff, so things can just slip along here so we can absorb and we can uh, move things along. But what happens is these panna cells are intimately connected to the autophagy process. So what is making them function as well as the intestinal stem cells is autophagy, okay? Because these cells are turning over a lot. Remember, this is vomit and poop. This is vomit and poop. So this is caustic. You, you have bile acids, you have hydrochloric acid, you have enzymes, you have a lot of stuff in here that you don't want. So these cells are turning over every four days, which is why autophagy is so important, friends, for gut health. Because if you never take a break from food, if you never do even just a 12 hour fast, if you're constantly getting up and eating right away, snacking, there are some bodybuilders that set their alarm at three in the morning to have a casein slow digesting whey protein shake and they wonder why they're dropping like flies after the age of 40, right? So they're constantly driving mTOR, never getting autophagy. And so this I think is a really interesting connection between fasting and gut health and why some of the studies have shown with just even just compressing your feeding window independent of any weight loss does lead to metabolic parameters because we're probably not stimulating this gastrointestinal lymphoid tissue. We're not driving that inflammatory pathway. So as exciting as this is, you might say, well, how can I test for these panda cells? You really can't. This is just sort of theoretical and proven mechanistic science at this point in humans and animals, but we do need to just keep this in mind. This is just really all these videos are for is motivation for you to make healthier lifestyle changes. So. Let's get into something that I think is even more exciting than the, these panna cells, as important as they are. They control the intestinal stem cell. Now, as I mentioned, you got vomit and poop and bugs coming through here, and your cells are turning over every four days, so you need stem cells to help replenish some of these damaged cells. Maybe, maybe you, you went binge drinking over the weekend, or maybe you took some non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or something. So your cell has some damage. I'm just gonna draw damage, damage, damage. Okay, so you need these stem cells to come up and repair, right? But if you're not getting the autophagy to enhance the panna cell function and physiology, and these intestinal stem cells depend upon the autophagy mechanisms, you're not getting that repair. So then guess what? You have inflammation, you have more reactive oxygen species. You might have bacterial inflammagens that can get across and stimulate your gut immune system. So you can see how then our feeding, our meal windows, our meal timing, fasting, staying in energy balance and not overdoing the calories, things like that, not having liquid fat. I think this is the important thing. I'm not against a bulletproof coffee, but I'm against having, say, just some you know, a milkshake, for example. In fact, many studies show milkshakes are one of the ways that they can it, cause these bacteria to come across more. Uh, and and they've, uh, various scientists throughout the world have actually tested this. Uh, and then you get higher blood levels of endotoxin and things like that. So too much liquid fat, again, I'm not anti-fat at all, but liquid fat is sort of not something that humans would naturally have eaten. So we, we get this damage and all that, and if we don't have the stem cells to repair or clean up, then guess what happens? We can have what's known, you know, colloquially as uh, leaky gut, or the more jargonistic, jargonistic term is intestinal permeability. And again, you can go into PubMed, intestinal permeability and obesity, intestinal permeability and diabetes, intestinal permeability and depression. Tons of data, I'm not just making this stuff up, there's absolutely data there. There's a, a great test actually from Dunwoody Labs where you can test your, your intestinal permeability. You, you can actually look at this by looking at what we're gonna talk about next, which is the tight junction proteins. So, Let's imagine we're taking a telescope and we're zooming in on my terrible art here and we're gonna talk about tight junctions or TJs, okay? These tight junctions, remember the gut has a tough job because your gut needs to absorb food, water, nutrients, and, and also prevent vomit and poop from coming in. So how does it do this? Well, it's these tight junction proteins. These are essentially the mortar. If you think about your gut, these are all bricks. You've seen a brick wall. You have red bricks. 
In between the bricks is a concrete-like substance called mortar. Mortar is actually pretty fun to work with if you ever have. But mortar is right here, and this mortar is made out of these tight junction proteins. There's donulin, occludin, clodin. There's all these different tight junction proteins. Now it turns out, friends, that guess what? This process of autophagy it comes back to play here with the tight junction proteins, and it's involved as well. So we have many different mechanisms here. Again, I'm, I'm repeating this so that it sticks for you, so that you understand the mechanistic ways that when you compress your fitting window, when you start exercising, when you don't overconsume energy, that you can improve your gut health by keeping a, a really uh, homeostatic, the maintenance cell functioning, the pan of cells. You're, by enhancing autophagy, you're making those cells more happy. You're making the intestinal stem cells function better. And moreover, and I think almost as importantly as these tight junction proteins, because What's really fascinating about this, and there's a ton of literature on this, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, and especially not tight junctions. However, I will tell you that there's crosstalk. If you have tight junction protein dysfunction or zonulin release in the small intestine, guess what? There's tight junctions in your epithelium here in, in the lung tissue, even in your endothelium of the cardiovascular system. So you can have leaky gut, leaky lungs, leaky endothelium. Not a good recipe for functioning and being living a healthy life. So. We want to make the main thing the main thing. And it seems that these enzymes and the process that they control, autophagy, are super important. So it doesn't mean that meat's bad. It doesn't mean that food is bad. It just means that there's a time to feed and there's a time to fast and exercise. And figuring out that balance for you so that you're losing weight but not losing too much weight. And you're able to maintain strength and have good workouts. So it's it's sort of a balance, and if you want to dive into some courses, I will link them below where we can help navigate you through some of that. But to me, I think this is super exciting. I don't know. I would love to know what you think. You can leave us a comment below. Let me know. And I will uh, put a link to this paper here, How Autophagy Controls the Intestinal Epithelial Barrier, and put links to some berberine if you want to kind of kickstart your AMPK process. But uh, I think this stuff is fascinating. It's really interesting now, you know, and I'll just finish off with a small story. I've been selling dietary supplements to doctors since 2006 and many doctors that I would work with when, when patients had issues with chronic issues, whether it's gut issues or they had uh, immune issues, things like that, they would often use a water fast or a super low calorie type fast where it's, you know, it's white rice and lamb, uh, 500 calories a day or something like that. So very low calorie, low protein, low fiber, things like that uh, for, for several weeks and patients would heal from many of their challenges, chronic challenges. And, part, and I, always, I always thought, well, how is that even working? What's the mechanism there and all that? And if you think about that, that's very similar to something you might find in like a fasting mimicking diet. And what we know from some of the research from that, from Walter Longo et al. at USC in California, has shown that low calories, periodically, you know, water fast or a fasting mimicking type diet, which is a super low calorie diet for an extended period of time, uh, followed by normal eating, that tends to enhance autophagy and affect these intracellular uh, molecular switches, as does just compressing your feeding window, a garden variety time restricted feeding. So um, I like to learn from the practitioners and then also sort of verify that with some of the research like we talked about here. And I think that's a good model for you. You got to learn from people who are in the field actually doing this stuff. So uh, I very, I'm grateful that you're still here tuning into this video. Hopefully you liked it. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for subscribing. And please let me know in the comments what you sort of think and what you find most effective for your feeding fasting window. We'll catch you in a future video down the road. Bye now.